Welcome to MarcusG.TV. I'm Chef Marcus Giuliano. I'm a chef on a mission. Today's mission is the science of food. You know, we see all these diets and all these, all these reasoning of why, how to eat healthy, why to eat healthy, and what to do, when to do it, how to wake up, how to go to sleep, how to wake up at 3 a.m. And, and do something special. And there's every diet is bombarding you with all of these like so-called techniques, um, tricks, um, gimmicks maybe perhaps. So we were asked recently, Marcus, what is the science behind eating healthy? That's an interesting question. And today, Carl's going to join me. Carl's off camera. Howdy, folks. Um, Carl will be um, very talking in depth about this. Uh, Carl is very knowledgeable about food science and uh, and Carl's been eating healthy for, gee, for years you've been you've been involved in the holistic eating movement holistic health movement 30 years now I think yeah so I'm amazed every time I ask Carl something he's got not only answers but really sometimes very specific answers so um, Carl and I are gonna do this together if you're watching this my hair's a little bit of a mess because uh, we were just out snowshoeing Oh, what an amazing sport, folks. Beat the winter blues. Get out and go snowshoe. Go cross-country yeah. ski. Get your heart moving and get in the woods. Yeah. It's an amazing experience. We had a phenomenal time today, and we broke a lot of snow. We actually went to a place today. Usually when you and I go snowshoeing, we go to a place where there's no tracks. Correct. Today we went to a place where there was a lot of tracks. There was like a main track going down the whole trail. And we spent a lot of time off the track because yep. when you're off the track is where you're going to break new snow and the snow is going up to my knees in some points absolutely good 18 inches easy <sighs> yeah breaking new snow picking your feet all the way up it's a great cross training it's a really phenomenal to get your heart rate up everything the movement in your body and uh, it's low impact because it's snow so it's not like you're pounding pavement it's not like you know you're jumping rope it's nice and easy so i would definitely suggest going out and snowshoeing while there's snow out there because guys a few more weeks and the snow's gone. Yeah. That's the reality. It's it's beginning of March, snow is gone. So, Carl, science of food eating, eating healthy. Where, where do we go? Where does one where does somebody start? What do we what do we do? Well, in, in the years that you and I have certainly been eating healthy and listening to our bodies and that's one of the things I may talk about a lot and you may uh, the listener may go, what does he mean by listening? Well, there are really very clear telltale signs about when your body is uh, consuming food afterwards in particular um, that'll tell you whether or not that meal was good or not. Um, if you're burping a lot, uh, feeling gassy, bloated, uh, find yourself with indigestion, feeling full even the next day, I guarantee you what you ate the day before was either was absolutely poorly combined and poorly digested because you're creating all this putrefaction, which is a, a lovely word that they use in a lot of the writing, uh, that your body is actually literally becoming a still and it's fermenting the food because it's not digesting fully, completely, or at all in some cases. Which means you're not digesting, things aren't moving quick enough, things right. are sitting on top of each other, things are sitting there way too long. I've always been taught, Carl, that the quicker the transition time, the healthier the food, the healthier us, yeah. the healthier the body. Get the food, get the food in and out. Talk about how our how our digestion system just set up to begin with, and and our normal transit time to begin with, and and maybe we can talk with how foods break down from quicker breaking down foods to longer. Well, one of the things, and I, everything that I talk about and Marcus talks about, we definitely absolutely 100% lean in your direction of organic non-GMO foods, especially when it comes to corn. But corn is one of those interesting foods that sometimes doesn't digest very well because one, we don't chew well. And mm -hmm. 30 years ago when I began doing all of this research, it's one of the things they talked about eating to dictate or to get a, some sort of a gauge on transit time. The time it takes for food to digest and, and go through your body. One end from, to the other. That's exactly right. So if you see chunks of corn at the other end, uh, with invariably most of us chew way too fast anyway, uh, you know how quickly, whether it's a day, 12 hours, or sometimes for some of you, it may take a week for that corn to that exit corn. Now, your body. Now here's, here's what I've also heard about corn, Carl. That corn, because it doesn't digest, is the wrong food to be looking at. I've heard that beets, if you juice beets, 
you take beet juice, oh, juice yeah. beets, eat beets. <laughs> yes. And beets have beet beets are fully digestible. They are because corn is not digestible. No, it's not. So I've heard more of an accurate read is beets one into the other. Yeah, and beets will change the color of what's coming out. Right. And, yeah, and I've known people to be frightened. So I know some people that go by corn. I yeah. know some people that go by beets. Yeah, I particularly do, go by beets. Yeah, you can do either one for sure. But that's a decent way of gauging in either case about what transit time is. And it will tell you how blocked up you are, how fast your digestive system is, and where you might need to tweak things. Right. Um, so a digestion always starts in the mouth. It's the very first thing that breaks down is when you chew food. It's the sugar that breaks down most uh, uh, quickly in your mouth. And then you have proteins that digest throughout the rest of your digestive tract after that. Um, so when you're combining, well, what, the first thing that you want to do, let's say if you want to prime your digestive system for eating, fruits first. That's the general rule of thumb. Uh, they're quick to digest. They're quick to go through the, the transit system, as it were. And uh, they're generally gentle on your digestive system. But again, it's going to depend on you. Like I know for me, I can't always eat citrus. See, so you said something very important in the beginning, that you have to measure your own body. Absolutely. You have to be your own barometer. You have to know how your body feels. Because honestly, what's good for me may not be good for you. And there may be lots of different reasons of why that's, of why that's the case. But let me, just, let me just break this down if I can. So fruit first. Fruit, fruit has a quicker transit time. That's right. Fruit has a lot of sugar in it, natural sugar, it does. fructose. So I'm assuming if fruit gets behind food that's not going to go through your body as quickly, that it's going to start fermenting. Correct. Absolutely. So let's say the classic example is that you generally have your children have dessert of fruit. Well, that may not be necessarily the very healthy thing for them to be eating afterwards, especially if you've given them a meal of, let's say, steak, or they've had a hamburger or a hot dog, or they've had French pasta, fries, French fries, 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 roast fries, chicken, exactly. barbecue chicken. But now, the odd thing is, fruit is healthy, but it's just now we're talking about eating at the wrong time. But Correct. now, don't get me wrong, I'd rather give my kids fruit after a bad meal than cake after a bad meal. Oh no, absolutely. That, so don't, I don't true. want people to misconstrue and say, oh, no. the fruit's bad, let me give them chocolate cake. Because people, the way they reason with things is so odd sometimes, right? Yes, absolutely. Oh, uh, they, they, they're like so strict that they're so stupid. That yeah. they're like, well, I can't eat that because of this, so let me go eat cheese fries. Because Nobody said right, anything exactly. about cheese fries. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, the cheese fries you're talking about a starch and a protein and a dairy all at once, and that's right. not really a good thing to be doing all at once because you're actually confusing your body's digestive system because you have different enzymes attacking different things at the same time, and they're kind of canceling each other out within the digestive system and making your digestive, digestive system really come to a halt. So I'm glad you made, that, made a point of that because we're taught on average, on, typically, to do as much food as possible on our plate, on our plate, get as many colors on our plate as possible, because we want as, as many different vitamins and minerals. But now the other side of that is that there's more to digest. Absolutely. More work to do, more conflict. Yep. So really, we don't want to. Now, mono eating has become very popular lately, where people will sit and eat four bananas, uh, eight oranges. Um, just a bowl of rice or a huge, huge salad with very minimal ingredients. Right. So what? So mono eating, I'm assuming, is going to be now very gentle on digestion because your body's not working nearly as hard. Exactly, exactly. As long as you're not uh, cross-combining foods that are really uh, at cross purposes with each other, like all vegetables, great. You could have a meal of three or four different types of vegetables and really not have a problem because they're all from the same family. They all have similar uh, uh, structures to them. They may all have similar uh, 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 starch profiles or fiber profiles, and your body is going to take that uh, and attack it efficiently. Then that's the whole point here: is the efficiency with which you di digest those foods. But like to think about fruits, you have high acid fruits, you have sub-acid fruits, and you have sweet fruits, and the sweet fruits obviously have higher sugars. The acid fruits are going to be tart, so you can mm -hmm. pretty much get all of that. Citrus fruits, pineapples, sour plums, uh, pomegranates, strawberries, um, those are all acid fruits. Sub-acid fruits would be apples, apricots, cherries, grapes, mangoes, papayas, and pears. And then you have sweet fruits, which are bananas, dates, figs, prunes, raisins, persimmons, 
Um, mango's my favorite. Yeah. And mangoes, happily, though, are in that sub-acid. So when you're making a fruit salad, let's say, uh, for your breakfast, or you're making a fruit salad and you're bringing it to the family picnic, you may want to eat that first and give yourself a minimum of two hours between eating the fruit salad and having what may be coming next as part of that meal. I would definitely avoid, though, eating it after the meal because that's really where you're going to end up having serious indigestion problems afterwards and whatnot and keep the fruits the same so the typical American fruit salad <laughs> usually includes oranges and grapefruits and bananas grapes and grapes <laughs> and apples and you now you've combined all three fruit categories and you're now at cross purposes with your body so so now I've learned like with melons eat them alone or leave them alone exactly melons definitely are one of those fruits that are an interesting digestive process. Now, I know for myself, I've had a compromised digestive system for an, a lot of years, and I always stay away from melons only because I know they're really kind of difficult to digest, even for me, even still. But if I, I know when I can and when I can't, and when I can, I'll devour an entire cantaloupe, an entire honeydew, or a Santa Claus melon, or something you know, really ripe and delicious and do it completely alone. Right, which goes back to the mono eating. Absolutely. Of, you know, like for me, I love eating two, three cantaloupes in the summertime for breakfast. Right. I love eating off the whole watermelon. Oh, I love watermelon. You know, it's just like I love eating eight oranges. I love eating three or four mangoes at one seating. Absolutely. And this is where we actually want to be because of the less confusion. Your body can focus its digestion. So it's interesting because mono eating versus this plethora of, of colors and everything on the plate. Now, I'm not saying to eat mangoes all day long, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right. Choose different foods for each meal, um, but have the same food. I'm not actually, actually choose the same food for each meal, but have different foods throughout the day. Exactly. So now let's talk about acid alkaline. Acid alkaline, because you mentioned acid fruits. Now, Acid and alkaline is a huge, huge buzzword in the diet industry, in the health movement. Uh, you have uh, Robert Young, who's, wrote the, who's written the PH Miracle very right. successfully, uh, has a clinic uh, to help people. A lot of other authors are out there. Acid, acid versus alkaline. Now, let's first say that fruits, or the way you measure alkalinity is based upon its mineral content. So people think of, well, oh, lemon is acid, because you talked about acid fruits being citrus. In actuality, it's alkaline to the body. To the body, it is. And to the body, it's alkaline. So it's different. We can go on and on and on about the science of eating because there's so many different theories and so much different evidence and proof of this way and that way. We're just covering the basics here. Let's just cover the basics with alkaline versus acid as far as eating and what how our body works. First of all, our body runs in an alkaline state, just above neutral, I think 7.2, 7.19, whatever right. it is. And everything we consume either is acid or alkaline. Right. Yeah, so starches, generally speaking, generally speaking, because there are some grains that will help promote your body's uh, internal pH to be slightly alkaline, uh, quinoa being one of them, amaranth, if I remember correctly, and millet, well, millet is millet. the other one. And these uh, are interesting grains because they're very easy to digest. Um, and put a lot less uh, taxing uh, effort, if you will, into the digestive system. So let's let's just give an example. So let's take like whiskey and scotch. <laughs> whiskey and scotch and a steak, okay, are on the extreme side of right. acid. Correct. Green leafy vegetables are on the extreme side of alkaline. Alkaline, me. okay. Yeah. So that's where it is. So if you're having a whiskey and a steak, and mashed potatoes with butter and heavy cream in them, you're consuming a highly, highly acidic meal. Acidic, if you're having yeah. french fries with it, that's a highly acidic meal. Yeah. You have to look at food as, okay, it's not, I mean, this, this, is the, this is the part with the science of food, Carl, that gets me crazy. People think that it's too difficult, and people know, okay, a french fry is healthier than a carrot, right? right. We know that. We all know that a carrot or, or tomato is better than f potato chips. So. People get caught up in the minutiae of, of, of diet terminology, of diet 
of books, uh, of, of, of methods, of an exact diet, and it's just, it's way too complicated. Yeah. Acid alkaline, fr fresh fruits, fresh veggies, the grains that you mentioned. Right. Unfortunately, dairy is on the acidic side. It is. Unfortunately, steak, most seafood is on the acidic side. Now, you can look at different acidic charts, and I've looked at a lot of different acidic charts over the years, and they're actually different. Yeah, they are. A lot of them don't agree on each other. That's true. So if you're going to say, oh, well, Marcus, there's fish that's alkaline, there may be fish that's alkaline, there may be fish that's acidic. And you may look at it one chart, and you may look at another chart, and you may look at one author versus another author. Yeah, I really, the I think the key here is knowing, like I said, it, it does one come back to knowing and listening to your body. So here's the thing. So you enjoy eating a steak, right? Let's say you, Joe Listener or Mary Listener really likes to have a steak for dinner. All right, fine. Then get the highest quality piece of beef you can get and don't combine it with bread. Don't combine it with potatoes. Don't combine it with starches. And have your veggies. You made an extremely good point about combining. We're going we're gonna to simplify in, in layman's terms about that. Before we talk about that, I think the one misconception about, about people's diet is people think they need to restrict calories. They think they need to be on a famine diet mm. to be healthy and to lose weight. And that's quite the opposite. It is. Your body definitely, you, first of all, you need the energy to think. You need your brain uh, needs sugars to uh, function properly. Your every system, cell in your body needs sugars. Right, every everything needs, you know, a carbohydrate to process so that you can definitely uh, keep your get up and go going. Um, it's that three o'clock lull though from having a bad food combining and or and or bad meals in general or very low quality nutrition of food uh, during the day that ends up that where you end up in that three o'clock slump. Right. So. Go ahead and um, why don't you talk about your experience, let's say, with in the last couple of years where both of us have done high density nutrition smoothies. Right. And how that's really been. Smoothies are incredible. So, digestion obviously begins in your mouth. The mm -hmm. science of digestion of the body in your mouth. When you put things in a blender or a juicer, but we're going to talk about blending smoothies. When you put things in a blender, the digestion starts in the blender. So what happens is you're taking the fiber, you're taking everything of that plant matter, the bananas, the oranges, whatever you're putting in there, the spinach, the kale, uh, the mustard greens, um, the parsley, the cilantro, the watermelon, and you're blending it and pulverizing it all together. So once it hits your mouth, a lot of the work, the preliminary work is already done. So now your body can start to assimilate that and absorb it much, much quicker. Uh, the the idea is that by doing a smoothie or a juice is that you're being able to take a, a large amount of food and concentrate it in a juice or a larger amount of food in a smoothie and be able to start the digestion process. Yeah. And you're starting off with nutrient-dense foods. Now, nutrient-dense or superfood is a food that contains more power for the punch. It contains, instead of a jab, it contains an uppercut. It's going to sock you with a lot more nutrients phytochemicals, amino acids, and enzymes as long as you're keeping it in its raw, natural state, not cooking it. Yeah. So a superfood is what you're after. You're after foods that are, you're getting more bang for your buck, more, more, more vitamins per chew, more, more whatever. So nutritionally dense foods are definitely the way to look, they're definitely the way to go. Now, a non, let's just give an example. A nutritionally dense food could be broccoli and kale. Could be. Versus potato chips versus um, a bowl of cereal, uh, something like cornflakes or something. Now, don't be fooled by the packaging of foods because foods like food labels, boxes, containers, bags, they like to list in the front what they have that's a selling point. So it could say 100% of vitamin C, this amount of daily dose of fiber. In actuality, they've added sugar, chemicals, preservatives to get to give you fiber. When you can just go to a banana, a ripe banana, of course, because a ripe banana has the most um, right. dissolvable, usable fiber. Uh, mushrooms, apples, oranges, lettuce and greens, things like that, broccoli. So people think, well, I can get all of my fiber from this bowl of cereal, right? Wrong. You can, but it's not nutritionally complete. It's not nutritionally rounded. It's not a, a food that's going to, it's been a food that's been altered, basically. Right. So I think that one of the first rules 
or in the science of eating food is eat food that's in its whole form. Absolutely. Don't eat anything that's from a box, that's from a package, that's been transformed, that has more than two or three ingredients. Yeah. You know, if you want rice, if you want crackers, get rice crackers. Rice flour and water. There you go. Don't get stuff with all the other stuff in it. If you want, um, if you want French fries, go buy organic potatoes, cut them yourself, and put them in the oven. Yep. And that's it. Don't buy frozen French fries and then put them in the microwave or the fryer and something like that, or that's been fried commercially. So healthy eating starts with the whole food itself. The whole food is so essential. And that's what your body needs because it's been figured out. Broccoli knows what, what it has. It has everything complete. A potato has everything complete. Whatever you're eating has everything complete, but when you're fractionating it, isolating it, partitioning it, preserving it, it's a whole, totally whole different story on how your body's going to actually react to that food. Yep. Now back to the actual caloric intake. It's so important that you actually consume enough calories because if you're not consuming enough calories, your body doesn't have, it tricks your body into starvation mode, into storing fat. It does a lot of things to damage your metabolism. And people think, I can count calories, I can eat 1,500 calories a day, and this and that. And the reality is, once you start counting calories, you have to count calories for the rest of your life. Yep. You have really done some metabolic damage. You've done damage to your body where once you go off of that, you're going to gain the weight back. Yeah. There's that yo-yo rebound effect, which... Um, rebound dieting can actually do so much damage that it makes it very difficult for you to lose weight the next time you go to try The next time you lose do it. That. So now, how about eating the unlimited amounts of calories of the right foods? Yeah, I mean your body, there's still a tipping point at which your body is going to end up storing excess calories as fat, but what's interesting about what you're saying is with a whole food your body is going to reach a place of satiety, a place of satisfaction, much more quickly because it is getting the nutrients that it needs and it's not going to, it won't trigger a hunger pang. It's not going to trigger, oh, I'm starving now. Right. Which I said to you a, a little over a year ago now, after a couple of months of doing green smoothies again, I found myself being fully satisfied very quickly and not eating nearly the volume of food that I had been because of the density of nutrition in the smoothies that I was making. And I still feel that way. It's an amazing experience, frankly. And but right. it goes back to what I started out saying at the beginning of this is that you really need to listen to your body because now when we think a particular way, oh, I'm hungry, it's 12 o'clock, I need to eat. Well, no, you may not need to eat. This is a habit. It becomes a habit that you know, like smoking may be a bad habit, this eating can be just as much of a crutch and a bad habit. So I had to actually go, you know, be self-reflective about this and go, wait a second, well, I'm not hungry, why am I eating? Right, exactly, because everybody else around you is eating. We're trained exactly. from a very young age in school. It's snack time, right. it's lunch time, it's nap time, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's cartoon time. No. We're